Hello and welcome back to the Global Gaming Business Podcast, the industry's first and longest running podcast now in our 19th year. As always, I'm your host, Jess Marquez, and our guest today is Sequoia Simmermeyer, former chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission, to talk about his tenure at the NIGC as well as the state of the tribal industry overall. This podcast is sponsored by iGamingPlayer.com, the premier affiliate marketing site that delivers quality players to your online casino, sportsbook, or poker room with transparency and integrity. Sequoia Simmermeyer's four-year tenure as chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission was perhaps the most unique of any to hold the position thus far, given that it included both the dismal lows wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic and the record-setting resurgence that followed shortly after. Simmermeyer championed several NIGC initiatives over those four eventful years, including the advancement of self-regulation, cybersecurity, fiscal reporting, and more. He and I spoke at the Ice London trade show in February and what were some of the final days of his tenure. Chairman, so good to see you today. This is the, I mean, we've been we've been able to talk several times over the last few years, so I always enjoy the uh, the opportunity to come and speak with you. And uh, how are you doing today? Doing well, likewise. Thank you so much for including NIGC and you guys great coverage, so thank you. Of course, yeah. Yeah, it's also so, good to see you. So we are smack dab in the middle of ICE 2024 here in London. And so I believe last year, I think we spoke, I want to say three times or something like that, two or three times. Now that the calendar has changed over to 2024, I'm very curious to hear kind of, is there one thing that the commission is most focused on for the year or kind of like the rest of 2024, what, are you, what is like your big picture, what's your main focus? Sure, I think a lot of it is gonna be implementation of the initiatives that we have been focusing on kind of throughout the recent years, but definitely helping to um, be a partner in the way the regulatory community thinks about technology both as opportunities for new types of platforms, but also as the threats that exist from cybersecurity and continue to try to help to promote good practices in that area. Well, that's definitely a huge topic, obviously. Uh, I've been here and seeing panels and stuff. That's kind of the, I mean, we're kind of like in year two of like that being like the biggest uh, kind mm-hmm. of thing. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't see that going away anytime soon. So that makes perfect sense. So like I said, we started the interview, we're here in London. And you being one of the uh, you know thought leaders and kind of the biggest figures in uh, U.S. tribal gaming, I, I understand you spoke at a panel uh, regarding U.S. and European regulations a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, one aspect that I want to talk to you about today that I don't believe we've ever really covered or ever really kind of broached on in the past is like, the, and it's very unique to tribal gaming, is the aspect of, of self-regulation. This is a huge initiative for you guys at the NIGC. And so obviously for maybe our international audience, those who aren't uh, as familiar with U.S. tribal gaming, kind of, could you, could you kind of like expand on what that really means for you guys and kind of, uh, you know, especially at this stage of time, what self-regulation means? Sure, well, the self-regulation program, um, the director for that program, Dustin Thomas, is a very talented um, uh, official with a lot of background in, in both compliance and management and the business side of the operations. Uh, So really happy to have him leading that charge. Um, For us, myself and the vice chair, self-regulation represents an authority within the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act um, that allows for uh, tribes to petition the commission for a certificate of self-regulation. And that certificate of self-regulation reduces some of the oversight role that the NIGC as the federal regulator has in that tribe's operations. Uh, So things like site visits, demands for information without a subpoena, um, and it also provides some cost savings to the tribe as well. Uh, and so um, for tribes that take this on, we think it's a great opportunity for them, if it's the decision that's right for them, uh, to kind of obtain the certification, not only for those benefits, but also to let other jurisdictions know about the strength of their regulatory capacity, uh, to let their own tribal members know and their citizens know about the role their gaming regulatory plays. In their, in their broader economy and in their broader government. Um, and it's an opportunity within tribal gaming regulatory bodies or amongst tribal government leadership to, to set goals for their community in terms of what types of metrics they want to achieve, uh, how they're gonna go about their public policy objectives through their regulatory body. So for Indian gaming, um, it's a provision within that act that allows for all that to happen. We see more and more of that and interest by tribes. The reason for it being in the act in the first instance is because uh, I think it's important to know that while the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act in 1988 established a framework for regulation for Indian gaming, uh, tribes were gaming before that. And both through uh, the enterprise itself and through oversight and regulation, 
uh, that predates the Indian Regulatory Act. So at the time of the legislation's debate and passage, um, there was concern from tribal leaders about the role that um, other regulatory bodies, like the newly created at that time NIGC, would play um, when tribes had their own jurisdiction, authority, and ability to, to regulate. And so this is one of the uh, provisions that was in there, in part for that reason. I think that's fascinating and really I just feel like I need to emphasize again for people who may not be familiar it's like it's always been fascinating for me as somebody who views the industry from a, as a whole the difference between you know tribal and commercial gaming well there's a lot of differences but that's kind of at the ethos I think of the biggest difference is like there's such a pride with the tribes to manage their own uh, you know regulations and kind of you can see how big of a deal that is for them to you know like I said you know, it's, it's prideful, that's the way I would describe it. And I don't mean to say, obviously, that commercial operators don't take it seriously, but I just don't see it, I don't see there's many problems, you know what I mean? I don't see as many headlines, it doesn't, and, you know, I see the record revenues alongside it, but, again, I don't see the, the same level of regulatory corruption. And I think that's important to point out every time that I speak with you and we talk about tribal gaming, it's just the the, um, the efficiency and the, the, the pride of, of the tribes themselves. Um, since we last spoke, there have been a, a number of high-profile developments in the tribal sector, uh, most notably, obviously, the Seminoles' uh, victory in Florida. I would say victory kind of in quotes because that's very legal uh, entrenched. It goes back and forth. I don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Mohegan tribe uh, was recently granted the gaming uh, license for the Inspire Resort in Korea, which I understand was an extremely arduous process, uh, very impressive. Without commenting on these specifically, this is, an, this is a time of huge growth for the tribal sector. And as a regulatory authority, what would you kind of say, what would you just say for operators to keep in mind during this time? Because obviously growth is it's very good. It's, it's, it's you know, you want it, but obviously it comes with a lot of potential downsides and pitfalls. So what would you say to kind of keep in mind during this time of just explosive growth in the tribal sector? Sure, I think, well, with any kind of change within an industry, there's always an opportunity for, uh, particularly in the case of the structure of the Indian Regulatory Act, for uh, tribal legislators and lawmakers at the local level to assess what their policy objectives are through their regulatory body. And so if there are um, changes, new offerings um, within the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act framework, there's an opportunity to assess your ordinance, an opportunity to um, establish um, goals you have with your licensing process that would help to meet your, your bigger mission in the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, uh, which the federal government shares with tribal governments, which is strong tribal economies, uh, improvements in tribal government capacity, and um, just helping to make sure that this resource that's benefited so many tribal communities and also regional economies remains intact and remains um, a future resource for all generations. Definitely. And I think, you know, you talk about the, the tribal economies, that's another big part of it is the, the diversity of tribal economies and, you know, tribes um, foray into new ventures and new investments mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, we'll definitely be covering that as the year goes on, especially in our tribal government uh, issues coming out in the spring. Um, on a personal note, so your five-year anniversary as chairman uh, is approaching this November. Um, that's a long tenure. Um, what are some things that, you know, kind of stick out in your mind from the journey? Um, what are just some things that, you know, you'll look back on fondly uh, from your time at the NIGC? I, obviously, there's no, I'm not insinuating that, you know, there's coming to an end or anything like that, but just when you think back on the time, uh, it's been a lot of, a lot of uh, exciting times, so what, what sticks out? Yeah, well, early on in the tenure, I've gained a strong appreciation for uh, tribal government for leadership, our own uh, leaders and subject matters at the NIGC, for their ability to be creative and resilient, both in navigating solutions from the pandemic, and then also to um, after the you know to keep moving and advancing in new areas and to leverage what we learn in that area. So I think for sure the the pandemic has been a significant. Um, moment for all of the industry, uh, but in the regulatory community, it gave us at the agency an opportunity to uh, change how and begin effectively engage with and collaborate with tribes on solving problems. So um, it's they helped us in our training program to grow substantially, uh, providing a more efficient and a, a broader accessible um, uh, 
catalog of, of, of training material and more responsive at the local level. Uh, it's also given us an opportunity to develop um, more resources, in particular for the pandemic, but as other priority areas that have come up, like cybersecurity or active shooters and critical event response. It's given us an opportunity to uh, to establish more uh, guidance that can promote best practices in that area. Um, and then I'm also, um, you know, I, I really have a strong appreciation for the collaboration that took place between tribes and the NIGC as we uh, assessed a number of different uh, areas of our regulations to try to modernize them, to be more transparent in how we interpreted and to be more consistent to make sure that that was, um, that was clear and that provided that certainty for the industry, but also within the regulatory community. Excuse me. I definitely agree, and I think this is a time. It's a very interesting time uh, for someone like myself in the media who gets to speak with a lot of uh, you know very uh, high up figures because it's almost like um, it's like a obviously uh, the pandemic was a terrible event that had a lot of disastrous consequences, but it was al also almost like a, a, a very interesting leadership example. And you see now with now that we've kind of emerged from it, and you see the people who are still standing, and like the people who have you know started before, and then went all the way through it, and just all the lessons learned and everything that um, that just came out stronger at the end. I think um, so. Definitely a fascinating time. I definitely agree. I think even beyond the the uh, gaming community, exactly. there yeah. were so many examples of tribal leadership who had develop strong collaborative relationships, particularly at the local government level. And it, um, I think, you know, benefited those communities and being able to serve their community and the broader non-tribal community around them. And I think that that is definitely an impressive part of how tribes reacted. Certainly. So thank you so much again for to uh, meet me today. I love speaking with you always. Uh, this is obviously the last ICE in London, so I'm finishing every interview with this question. Um, what has been your favorite part about visiting London, and uh, what's one thing you're going to miss uh, eventually, uh, obviously, when we ship off to Barcelona next year and beyond? Sure. Um, I've never been to Barcelona before, so I don't know that was to, in comparison, me but either. I know that what's been exciting about um, the opportunities you've had to be here in London is it's an extremely international city, yeah. and it's just the level of activity and collaboration, and it's, it's really energizing, I think. Um, to, to see that. So I, I really very much enjoyed that, the time that I've been here for ICE. Um, and it is absolutely just a um, important part of understanding trends in the industry. So that's always invigorating and exciting to see. So, um, yeah. yeah. Certainly. Well, Chairman, thank you again for joining me today. IGA is actually, as we speak, is right around the corner in about a couple months uh, yeah. from now in Anaheim. I will be there. That's I'm excited. That's right in my backyard. I can drive to a show for that's once. Right. That's right. That's, that's very good for me. Uh, so, again, I'll, I'll be, I'm sure I will see you there, too, and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, thanks again for joining me today, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Absolutely. Thanks. This sounds good. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed this week's podcast sponsored by iGaming Player, the premier affiliate marketing site that delivers quality players to your online casino, sportsbook, or poker room with transparency and integrity. To learn more about the topics we just discussed, visit ggbmagazine.com. Subscribe to GGB News to get all the news of the gaming industry delivered to your desktop every Monday morning. Sign up at ggbnews.com and use the coupon code GGB180 for a free subscription. Don't miss a single episode of the podcast. Subscribe on Amazon, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify today. So we'll see you next time on the GGB Podcast.